This video will review some of the basic information necessary to conduct a hearing screening. It is necessary to recognize that a hearing screening does not diagnose a hearing loss. It identifies children who are at risk for hearing loss who need further testing. 130 out of every 1,000 children have a hearing loss that can potentially affect communication, learning, and psychosocial development. These children often display frustration and anger, frown and strain to hear when listening, and say, huh, and what, frequently. These children are easily fatigued, have poor attention, limit participation in class, look for visual cues to class assignments by watching other children, and often prefer individual activities, such as looking at books, rather than playing with other children. Children with hearing loss, even hearing loss of mild degree, are at greater risk for poor academic achievement than children with normal hearing. They have more difficulty listening and understanding in a background of noise. Children with hearing loss in just one ear are 10 times more likely to have to repeat a grade in school compared to children with normal hearing. The first step in intervention for children with hearing loss is the identification or screening process and then referral for comprehensive testing. The ear is a complicated organ used to hear sounds. It takes sound waves from the air and transforms them into signals that the brain can understand. The ear has three main parts, the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The outer ear is the part of the ear that you can see. The pinna is the outermost structure that acts like a satellite dish, catching the sound waves and directing them into the ear canal. And the ear canal directs the sound waves to the eardrum. The middle ear begins at the eardrum, also known as the tympanic membrane, which is a thin membrane stretched tight across the ear canal. The eardrum is attached to a chain of bones called the ossicular chain. The individual bones in the ossicular chain are called the malleus, or hammer, the incus, or anvil, and the stapes, or stirrup bones. When the sound waves hit the eardrum, the drum vibrates the chain of bones in this air-filled cavity, and the signal is sent to the inner ear by the vibrating bones. The inner ear, or cochlea, is a fluid-filled tube, coiled like a snail and lined with thousands of tiny hairs. Each movement of the middle ear bones creates a fluid wave in the inner ear. The movement of the fluid causes the hairs to move and convert the signal to electrical energy that is passed onto the brain and interpreted as sound. A problem anywhere in the outer, middle, or inner ear can cause temporary or permanent hearing loss. There are three categories of hearing loss. They are conductive, sensory neural, and mixed hearing loss. A conductive hearing loss is a loss that occurs because of a problem in the outer or middle ear. In many cases, a conductive hearing loss can be medically or surgically treated. One characteristic of this hearing loss is the person may still be able to hear his or her own voice at the normal level, but is not able to hear other people. Impacted earwax, perforated eardrum, and middle ear infection, also known as otitis media, are three common causes of conductive hearing loss. A sensory neural hearing loss is caused by dysfunction of the inner ear or auditory nerve. This loss is usually permanent and is not medically treatable. With this type of hearing loss, a person may have difficulty hearing his or her own voice, as well as other people talking. Hearing loss due to meningitis, prenatal rubella, family history of childhood hearing loss, and hearing loss associated with aging, also known as presbycusis, are common causes of sensory neural hearing loss. A mixed hearing loss includes both a conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. The conductive part of the hearing loss may be medically treatable, but the sensory neural part is usually permanent. Frequency is a physical characteristic of sound. When listening to sound, we perceive changes in frequency as changes in pitch. The normal ear can perceive sounds from a very low pitch to a very high pitch. 
The frequency range for normal ears is 20 to 20,000 cycles per second, or hertz. The range of sounds for our daily listening needs is limited to a smaller frequency range. Specifically, frequencies of 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz are critical for hearing and understanding speech sounds. A child with a hearing loss in this frequency range has a distinct disadvantage compared with children who have normal hearing. A child with a hearing loss may hear some sounds, but not understand speech. In other words, the child may hear someone speaking, but have difficulty understanding what is said. Intensity is another physical characteristic of sound. When listening to sound, we perceive changes in intensity as changes in loudness. The normal ear can perceive very soft sounds to very loud sounds. The intensity range is from about zero decibels to over 100 decibels. A child with a hearing loss loses the ability to hear soft, moderate, and sometimes even loud sounds depending on the degree of hearing loss. The audiogram is a graphical representation of hearing ability. Frequency, or pitch, is located along the top of the graph. Intensity, or loudness, is located along the side of the graph. A lawnmower has a low-pitched sound, but it is very loud. A bird whistle has a high frequency, or high-pitched, sound, but it is very low in intensity, or loudness. The sounds of speech vary from low to high pitches and from soft to moderate loudness. The speech sounds are commonly represented on the audiogram in the shape of a banana, the speech banana. Low-pitched sounds like mmm and n would be located in one part of the speech banana, and high-pitched sounds like sh and s would be located in another part. Children with normal hearing can hear all of the speech sounds. Children with a mild or moderate hearing loss may hear some of the sounds, but not others. To them, speech may sound muffled and difficult to understand. Children with more severe hearing loss may not be able to hear any of the sounds of speech without hearing aids or other amplification devices. One of the most important parts of the hearing screening program is the screening room. If the screening occurs in a room that is too noisy, a large number of students with normal hearing will fail. It is never acceptable to raise the intensity of the tone to compensate for a noisy environment. Find a location that is as quiet as possible and away from the main flow of traffic. Possible locations include vacant classrooms, the nurse's office, the library or media center, or a storage closet, one with electrical outlets that is large enough to accommodate the screener and child comfortably. An audiometer is an electronic instrument designed to measure hearing. Avoid dropping or banging the audiometer as it is easily damaged. It should be stored at temperatures above freezing and below 90 degrees and should not be left in a car during extreme weather conditions. The cords should be stored free of tangles and twists. When preparing the audiometer for a hearing screening, first plug the instrument into a wall outlet. A three-pronged adapter may be needed. Take care not to create a tripping hazard by running the electrical cord between the door and the testing table. The earphones should be cleaned after each child using an alcohol-free wipe. Alcohol-based cleaners may dry rot the rubber cushions. Moisture should be kept away from the hole in the center of the earphone, called the diaphragm. Turn the power switch to on. For some audiometers, the right and left ear buttons are marked. For others, the output for the right ear is marked in red, and the output for the left ear is marked in blue. The tone level or tone button produces a tone when pressed. There are two dials. One controls the frequency of the sound and is measured in hertz, abbreviated capital H, small z. The other controls the intensity of the sound and is measured in decibels, abbreviated small d, capital B. Perform a listening and visual check every time the equipment is turned on using the following steps. Inspect the cords and the headset for any visible damage. Be sure they are correctly connected to the audiometer. Put the headset on. Check your own hearing at 20 dB at 1000 Hz in the right ear. Then check 2000 and 4000 Hz, also at 20 dB. Then check the left ear starting at 4000 Hz, then 2000 Hz, and finally 1000 Hz, keeping the intensity level at 20 dB. The audiometer is in need of repair 
if the tone does not sound normal, if no sound is produced when the tone switch is pressed, if static is heard, if the earphones do not remain in proper position over the ears, if a dialer switch does not function, if indicator lights do not glow, and if the cords are frayed or the earphone cushions are ripped. In addition to daily listening checks, it is important that the equipment be calibrated by a professional testing facility at least once a year. The date of the last calibration check should appear on the audiometer or be available from the calibration file from the school system or the health department. Instruct the student that he or she will hear a beep, first in the right ear and then in the left ear. The student should raise their hand every time the beep is heard, even if it is very, very soft, and lower their hand when the beep goes away. Give the student frequent praise for listening carefully. If a student does not seem to understand the directions, remove the headset and repeat the instructions. If the directions are not understood after repeat instruction, remove the headset and allow the child to return to class. Demonstrate the screening procedure to the student by presenting a tone at 100 dB with the headset on the table and have the student raise their hand when the sound occurs and lower their hand when it stops. Here's what we're going to do. Whenever you hear the beeps, you're going to raise your hand, okay? Now listen, listen. Justin, there you go, okay? And you got to listen for the beeps. Whenever you hear them, raise your hand, and when they go away, you have to put your hand down. Can you do that? Okay, turn around. Now listen. You Be go. sure to Good turn girl. down the intensity okay. before placing the earphones on the child, as a 100 dB tone can be painfully loud right next to the child's ear. Place the red earphone on the right ear and the blue earphone on the left ear. Tighten the earphones onto the ears by adjusting the band on the headset so there is a snug fit over the ears and the earphones do not slide down off the ears. Do not permit students to place their own earphones. The earphones should be placed so the diaphragm of the earphone, the hole in the center, is directly over the ear canal. Ask students to remove eyeglasses, large hair clips, large or dangling earrings, or headbands. Small earrings should not be a barrier to a snug fit. If necessary, push hair behind the ears before placing the earphones. Follow these procedures for the screening. Be sure the child cannot see the examiner pressing the button, directly or via a mirror or reflective glass. Always screen the right ear first. With the intensity dial set to 20 dB and the frequency dial at 1000 Hz, present the tone for 2 to 3 seconds and then release. Turn the frequency dial to 2000 Hz, present the tone for 2 to 3 seconds and then release. Turn the frequency dial to 4000 Hz, present the tone for 2 to 3 seconds and then release. Change the selector to the left ear. With the intensity dial still at 20 dB, present tones at 4000 Hz, 2000 Hz, and 1000 Hz in the left ear. Okay, ready? Good girl. Great. Good listening. I'm going to do the other ear now. Girl. If the screener has any question about the accuracy of the test results, a rescreening should be recommended. If the student does not respond to any tone in either ear, they have failed the screening. They must hear all six tones to pass. If the student responds to all of the tones in both ears, they have passed the screening. Be sure to mark pass or fail on the screening form and include the student's name and the date of the screening on the form. Additional information may also be required. Conducting an effective hearing screening and keeping accurate records are the first steps in a successful hearing loss identification program. When a child fails a hearing screening, it is important that we follow up with diagnostic testing to make sure that we can either confirm or deny the hearing loss. With appropriate intervention, we can ensure that the child receives the services that they need from the city school system or the city health department 
in order for them to succeed and for us to minimize the impact of the hearing loss on the child's communication, learning, and psychosocial development.